Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God. May I be like you. Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God. May I be like you. You are the Father. I love the Mold me and make me. This is what I pray. Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God. May I be like you. Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God. May I be like you? May I be like you? May I be like you? Amen. 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 What a song, what a prayer that... Uh... All of us should be sharing together. Change my heart, O oh God. Make me more like you. Want to say good evening to all of us who are on. I do note that there seem to be some technical challenges all around, but we give God thanks that the majority of us who are here are able to hear clearly. We are able to see clear enough if it is that uh, you are able to see my video and by the grace of God no matter what occurs beyond this that the message will come across in the way that he would have determined would be in our best interest I want to thank uh, Pastor Richards and the Board of Elders the Board of the uh, Greater Pope Moore Seven Adventist Church for inviting me to be here with you tonight want to welcome all the members and visiting friends, not only from Greater Pope Moore, but from Hellshire and other churches around and about the environment of Pope Moore Central Jamaica Conference, maybe even overseas. So it is my pleasure to be here with you tonight. And uh, without further ado, being uh, aware of the time, let's get into the word. Sister... Bennett, my friend, uh, shared that I'm an eloquent person. I always uh, show that a little bit when I hear certain adjectives used regarding me. So what I'm about to do may be like what she would have shared regarding uh, my person, because I'm about to talk about Jamaican Bandulu. <laughs> so I may not sound so eloquent with the Jamaican Creole, but we are starting off with some Bandulu. All of us know what Bandul is. I am I am assuming that as Jamaicans, this word is not foreign to any of us. All of us know what Bandul is. But to define it succinctly, Bandulu is being able to achieve an outcome through fraudulent means. And as much as sometimes we would like to Excuse it. I, I've heard I saw the system run. If you know, do this, you know, get through. And regrettably, in so many instances, we are actually 
forced by our culture and by our system to practice Bandu. But what we should be able to recognize by the end of the night is that uh, our system, our culture, this aspect of it, it is something that we will need to start uh, being aware of and actively oppose. And the reason for this is because of uh, the eighth commandment that we will be looking at tonight. You shall not steal. We are going to understand beyond just the word steal, beyond the words of the law, we, by the end of tonight, should also understand the spirit in which the command was given. And we'll also be aware, be made aware of uh, some deeper truth regarding what we call the Ten Commandments. So tonight, we are going to go into some Jamaican Creole, mash down the bandolo, and uplift for the law of God. Let's pray. We give you thanks, Lord, for sparing our lives, for bringing us all here together on the electronic medium. And I do pray and hope that, according to your will, that... Uh, what you have given me will be brought across clearly to your people and all of us will be benefited by having been here tonight. Thank you, Lord, for your word and for what you're about to do with me and with your people. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The initial telling of the contractual terms between God and Israel happened soon after the arrival of the, of the people to Mount Sinai. And you'll hear me use uh, terms like contractual and covenant because these words uh, truly encapsulate what we call the Ten Commandments. Some of us may not even recognize that uh, there was a second iteration of the Ten Commandments in Deuteronomy. This iteration of the commandments was just spoken of and written by Moses. The first iteration at Mount Sinai was spoken by the mouth of God. And I don't know if some of us, uh, I hope the previous presenters would have uh, shared with us that before they were on tablets of stone, God spoke in the hearing of the people. So God spoke and wrote in Exodus, Moses spoke and wrote in Deuteronomy. So the aim of the covenant was to show the wisdom of God, the wisdom of Yahweh. And you find that in Deuteronomy 4, verse 6. Moses told the people that when you follow this law, it will show your wisdom to the people. But what this really was trying to do with the children of Israel was to help them to live in a way that was against the natural order that was established. Just like our Jamaican culture, our Jamaican system that makes us feel like Bandulo is a thing. We are going to be called tonight to live in a way that is contrary to the natural order that we would have been cultured into. So the binding force of the covenant stipulation, so follow all the terms I'm using, there is still a binding force of the covenant stipulations today because it is still the wisdom of God. What God gave to the Israelites, what God shared with the people, it is still his wisdom. And for us tonight, we are going to examine how this eighth covenant stipulation, otherwise called the eighth commandment, would have shown forth the wisdom of God to the world. The first thing I want to share with us uh, in terms of uh, still giving an overview is that uh, having lived under the Egyptian system for over 10 generations, over 400 years, one passage says 400, another passage says 430, wherever the phone started, we know that the people, the children of Israel, are living in a different system, under different rules, under different laws, for over 400 years. 
And it was necessary for God to reorient them. God needed to change their direction, mental, spiritual, emotional, all the as that we can think about. God needed to reorient them, to shift them from what they were accustomed to, to the new normal. Some of us were afraid of that term during the COVID pandemic. But the other thing that we must make note of is that this reorientation was necessary because it was not only the children of Israel who left Egypt, but the Bible tells us in Exodus 12, 38, that there was a mixed multitude. A lot of other people left Egypt with them. They saw the majesty of God, the majesty of Yahweh, and they decided that if God, if the God of the Israelites, Yahweh, can attack and destroy the gods of Egypt because uh, you should know that every plague that uh, fell on Egypt was uh, an act that destroyed the faith of the people in one particular major god that they served in Egypt. So think about any and every plague and if you do your research, you'll find that each plague, each occurrence, each attack against the Egyptian system was an attack against one of their gods. So this mixed multitude, seeing that uh, the Israelites God is bigger, better, and badder, decided that we are going to go with these people because... This God is great. So these articles of agreement that we call the Ten Commandments acted as a guide for the people beyond the words that were used to express them. And we must understand what was said before we undertake an examination of what the spirit of the words mean or what they are sharing with us. There are many times that things are lost in translation. And I have shared in other audiences before that while I was doing French at NCU, something my lecturer said affected how I approached and thought about uh, the theological space going forward. She said to me, because in trying to get French right, I was trying to translate English in my head to speak the French out of my mouth. And she got so annoyed with me in one class that she said to me, Mr. Lopez, Mr. Lopez, stop thinking in English and think in French, think in French. And when she said that to me, in the moment dealing with the language of the languages of French and English, I was then brought back to the biblical languages, the Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. And it dawned on me more forcefully that in order to understand what the word of God is saying, at the time it was in the mid-20-teens, for us now it's 2024, we have to remove ourselves from 2024 and push ourselves back into AD 31, back all the way to BC 1200 and beyond because it's only when we are immersed in the world of those who are represented in the holy words will we be able to recognize what the words meant to them when it was shared and how we can properly apply the principle of these words to our lives so the eighth commandment is universally translated, you shall not steal. The you, second person a pronoun, represents Israel and a mixed multitude. And the injunction, so the negative particle not, that injunction that comes after the not, not steal. So that word steal can also be translated as defraud or deceive. And that deception is by using a person's ignorance against them. I'll say that one more time. Steal in the passage, the Hebrew can also be translated as defraud 
or deceive and that deception is by using a person's ignorance against them to take what the person had. So Yahweh, God spoke the words with his mouth and later wrote it with his finger. This act, this act in of itself provided a glimpse into the relationship between God and the people. God was sovereign and they were vassal. In other words, they were a people who had a higher authority over them. So while Moses was their leader, God was the one who directed Moses to direct them. If you do a little historical study, you'll understand the meaning of what I just shared about the sovereign over a vassal. So that's it with the overview. So let's get into three things that I want us to grasp about uh, the commandment, as we call it, that uh, covenant, that covenant stipulation, you shall not kill. You shall not steal, sorry. Kill is a, is a fun one, but uh, we are doing steal tonight. God was proposing an action to his people and then negating it. Therefore, the commandment was propositional. God put something in front of the people saying, there is stealing. But you, if you want to meet my people, will not steal. In other words, God was communicating that my people are not thieves. In other words, if while we are going through this presentation, the Spirit of God speaks to any one of us to point out something in our lives that will make us fall or be guilty under this covenant stipulation, you shall not steal then it is something that we will have to work on and repent from. Because again, God is saying through this commandment, through this covenant agreement, my people are not thieves. So if we are thieves, we are not God's people. So if we want to consider ourselves God's covenant people through the blood of the sacrifice of Jesus, we cannot be thieves. So let's go further into it. The second thing I'll share with you, because I didn't intend to be long tonight, the second thing I'll share with you is that the stipulation is broad. So it's not as narrow as the few words that were used to share the agreement. I, I I I wish I could do an introductory to the ten words as they are called in in the, the Jewish setting, so that we can understand what it really meant to the people at Sinai when God spoke these words. But the term here, the the stipulation here, the clause of the covenant that we are looking at, number eight, you shall not steal. It is broad. Just like every other stipulation of the covenant, this is also broad. The people were forbidden from stealing in any of its types or forms. So whatever bracket of stealing one would fall under, stealing would be stealing. And God was saying, do not participate in it. So any sort of fraud, any sort of fraud, politician, private sector, church, mighty God, any sort of fraud, societal gammas, is breaking of the covenant. Any type, any sort of fraud. 
this one may knock some of us. And I have shared it with my churches and ever fundraising, fundraising events are brought forward. Overpriced fundraisers are breaking up the covenant. Because we are charging for something as much as it's a fundraiser, it must be equitable. The purchaser must receive requisite uh, fear for the money expended. So if it's $2,000 for a ticket, what is received must be worth $2,000. We cannot give a value of $500 and take from an individual $2,000. Uh, some people may already start not liking me by me saying that, but I have to tell you what was given to me. Overpricing a piece of work is a breaking of the covenant. So just like overpricing fundraisers, if we are entrepreneurs or there is uh, an activity that uh, we are to do and it has value to it, we know that the activity is value $10, but we also know that the person paying the price for it does not know that the work is valued at $10. And because of the ignorance of that person, we charge them $20. And they gladly pay it because they think that they're getting a deal when we know that the value of the work is $10. That's breaking the covenant. That's going beyond the scope of you shall not steal. Some of us may have employees and we work them until their fingertips are raw or like some African housewives, uh, we allow them to take up for pots hot pots with their bare hands over and over and over until the nerve endings in their fingers are burnt to a crisp and they no longer have any feeling in the tips of their fingers. And then we pay them a pittance. Under pain of our workers is a breaking of the covenant. Taking anything without implied or tacit permission, other words, we know that it's okay to take it or we have received uh, overt permission. We were told that anything here we can take. But if we were not given that permission, rather, whether implied or tacit, and we take it, there's a pen at work. And it's not by mistake. It belongs to the organization. But I like this pen. Some simple, simple. I like this pen. And we take it. We never receive permission to take it. That's breaking of the covenant. They are wasting toilet paper at work. So since they are wasting it at work, and uh, I have need of it at home. I'm going to take it. Simple, 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 something. No permission was given. That's a breaking of a covenant. These examples. I don't know, because when I was putting the work together, it, it also really struck me thinking about my own life and uh, my own situations and my own experiences. And I had to just be saying, mighty God, <laughs> Father, forgive me. Because in the time of ignorance, he winks. That's why sometimes it's better not to know. <laughs> but when knowledge comes, God doesn't bat an eye anymore. His eyes are wide open and trained on us. So after tonight, don't curse me that I open your eyes about these things. As your theme says, uh, 
God's will should be what we strive for. So by his power and grace, let us allow his spirit to lead us and allow the works of Jesus to flow out of us because Jesus is no thief. Withholding what is due to another person is a breaking of the covenant. And an example I'll use here is in 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 to 6. And when you read that, you'll recognize that Paul here was speaking about the sexual relationship between men and women. And he said, defraud not each other. In other words, if you do not intend for this church sister to be your wife, I don't know if I have any young men. I know George is here. I don't know if I have any other young men in the hearing of my voice. You don't intend to marry the girl. Don't take from her what should not be yours. Ladies, same thing if you don't intend on marrying the young man. Don't take from him what is not yours. Because certain things are only given within a covenant. I want that one to sink in again, so I, I'm going to repeat it. Certain things are only given within a covenant. So once there is no agreement, there is no covenant, there is no treaty, whatever synonym you want to use here. Once there is no agreement, it is fraud. And even in the case of sexual relations, it is true. So brethren, thou shalt not uh, steal is a broad concept. The last thing I want to share with you is that uh, the covenant agreement is beneficial. Covenant agreement is beneficial. I want to share with you that Israel was receiving a lesson in how to be godly humans. It was necessary. Remember, they were in Egypt for over 400 years. It was necessary for them to grasp the situation from which they were rescued and to view it in the proper context. We will remember that they are so forgetful or they were so forgetful that in their wilderness wandering, they started cursing about all the good things of Egypt and completely forgot of the terrible lives that they lived, how they were taken advantage of. But God, again, as I said, needed to reorient them. He needed to change their position. He needed to change their viewpoint. They needed a proper context to view what they were rescued out of. There in Egypt, many things were stolen from them by the Egyptians. Their time was stolen. Their strength was stolen. Their health was stolen. Their wages were stolen. And their lives, their very lives were stolen. All those children, male ch children who were killed, they stole the lives and the future of the Israelite people. But one theft preceded all of these. So the stealing of their time, strength, health, wages, lives, there was one thing that preceded all of this. And it was the fact that the Israelites themselves were stolen. They did not go to Egypt to be slaves. They went to Egypt under the invitation of the ruler of Egypt. They did not go there to suffer in 100 degree heat, making bricks to build pyramids. 
They did not go there to be beaten and to be driven about like wild animals, like, like cattle. I wouldn't say not wild animals, like, like herds of cattle and sheep. They did not go there to be taken advantage of in these ways. They were invited. But in the midst of their prosperity there, the very Egyptians who invited them recognized that they could be stolen because they were in their possession. They were in their territory. And so they captured the Israelites and turned them into their slaves. That's why when we read in Exodus 21, 16, God added some clarity. God said to Israel, he who kidnaps a man and sells him, or if he is found in his hand, shall surely be put to death. And I know a lot of us can think about different instances in the Bible where somebody was uh, stolen, kidnapped, and sold. God outlawed this. He, he emphasized a portion of thou shalt not steal by saying if you kidnap somebody and sell them or if you kidnap someone and you are still found with a person, you will be killed. That is the judgment against you immediately. But can I share something with you before I get into some celebration and close? The word here translated as kidnap is the same word that is translated steal in the Eighth Commandment. In other words, God was telling Israel, do not be men stealers. Because there was an entity who specialized in man stealing. Like the Egyptians who stole Israel away, we have an adversary who has come into this earth to accomplish the same thing. There is one who has come down that his own aim is to steal us away. But I can give God thanks tonight and we, shall, and we should give God thanks tonight that we have one who was willing and able to buy us back from that adversary who stole us away. Peter made it plain in 1 Peter 5 verse 8, be sober, be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. This adversary does not care about what is right. This adversary does not care about what is legal. This adversary does not care about the welfare of humanity. This adversary only cares about stealing us away. And that's why Jesus told his audience in John 10, the first part of John 10, Verse 10, he said, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. This adversary that Jesus was speaking of, this uh, thief that Jesus uh, referenced through his metaphor, this thief, this adversary is a man stealer. This adversary is a life stealer. This adversary is a defrauder. He's a trickster. He's a deceiver. This adversary Praise God, just like Egypt, there's a prophesied end to this adversary. The Bible told us in Genesis 3.15, and I will put active hatred, enmity, between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall crush your head, and you shall bite his heel. The law will catch up to this adversary. God told us that there's going to be a day that his head was going to be crushed. The law. Oh, we love talking about the long arm of the law when we watch movies or in other facets and aspects of life. The long arm of the law. The law is going to catch up to this adversary. The coming of the adversary 
is lost to us as human beings. We did not gain through sin. We did not gain by allowing him to snatch us away from the saving grace of God. We gain nothing but a looking forward to death, a looking forward to terror, a looking forward to sorrow, a looking forward to pain. We gain nothing by the coming of the adversary. But praise God, the last part of verse 10 of John 10 said, I have come, that is Jesus. So the coming of Jesus in this verse says, I have come that you may have life and that you will have it more abundantly. Jesus rescues us from the lowering lion, roaring lion. Jesus rescues us from being stolen away. Jesus rescued us from becoming lawless ones. Jesus, rather than bringing us to Mount Sinai, rather than bringing us through that desert, rather than having us shroud the dusty earth, Jesus instead brought us to the foot of the cross. That's why the songwriter says, at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away, it was then by faith I received my sight and now I am happy all the day. And that's why Paul declared that when we meet Jesus, when, when we are at the foot of the cross, when that blood that was freely flowing wraps us up and, 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 and collides with our sin and, and, and melts it away, cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Paul says in Ephesians 4, 28, let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. God is calling us to change from a life of thieves. And if we see in our own experiences that we have embarked down a road where we were conflicted as having broken this portion of the covenant, God is saying to us through his word, stop it. Let us do better. Let us put aside the bandulu. Let us put aside the grafting. Would you be free from your burden of sin? Would you be free from your burden of stealing? Tonight, I remind you, there is power in the blood of Jesus. Remember, the passage, the covenant stipulation is propositional. The covenant stipulation is broad. It is also beneficial, but best of all, we are assured that Jesus will rescue us and has rescued us from the ultimate theme, the adversary Satan himself. So let us not walk in the way of he who only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But let us re root ourselves, cement ourselves in him who came to give life and for us to have it more abundantly. God bless you as you go through the rest of this series. Amen.